What's up, RPG people? This is Barda College, and today we are talking hex crawling and methods of doing so. And with me, my guest today is Michael S., aka Chicago Wiz. Welcome to the show. Thank you, and thank you for having me on. It's pretty cool. This is the first uh, video interview I've ever done. Awesome. So yeah. Well, yeah, and 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 uh, and you are a great example of somebody who's out there just following, pursuing their their passions of mm -hmm. gaming and you've got this really interesting method of of the three hex crawl and so mm -hmm. I, that's how i found you and i wanted to talk to you about that oh but, sure but sure, first sure. but first i kind of wanted to start out with my assumptions and we can go from there as far as gaming and maps and hex crawling okay so okay. that's our subject well um so it seems to me that role playing is a huge endeavor in scope. When you think about all of the different things that go into it, we're, we're acting sort of, you know, when we're role-playing as these fantasy characters. We're writing a lot because, you know, that has to do with the creation of adventures and writing down our ideas and journaling everything. Um, mm -hmm. There's also crafting and even cartography involved. Mm -hmm. And the more I've played role-playing games, and hosted them or played in them, um, I've been understood more and more that mapping is important. It's important to the the telling of the story and how you approach maps. It it has a dramatic effect on the way you're telling your story, whether or not you're traveling large long distances or um, are you uh, searching through a particular area with a fine tooth comb. You know, it all kind of comes from the map and the way you approach it. So, mm, okay. so when I've kind of started studying hex crawling, I, I realized that it's not a very popular thing, at least right now. It was in the beginning back when D&D maybe got its start. And uh, as I've come to understand, that may have been <clears throat> because D&D's uh, origins is from wargaming. And hex, hexes are actually part of the whole wargame experience, is how you chart out your movement and so on. Um, mm. But... What I've kind of, my assumption is hex crawling is not very popular right now because it tends to be boring. And so there's a good way to do it and a bad way to do it. You have seen to have some success <laughs> with hex crawling. So tell me about it. Um, yeah. Well, first you should ask my players how they feel about it right now because they're, they're currently in the middle of a, what you would call a hex crawl. And, uh, they're they're appropriately challenged right now. They they just faced a they faced a real dragon uh, in in last uh, yesterday's game, and um, they used a uh, a loophole in my D thirty rule and he killed the dragon in one shot after it almost killed three of them. <laughs> so uh, it, it, they they might have this idea of oh man his his hex crawls are really bad. Um, so. Well, you touched on a number of things. First off, um, hex crawling to me is 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 about being on the outside. You know, there's really several things you can do in a D and D game. You can be in town um, and you know play in the town and, and, and do what you're going to do there. And a lot of people do that because they like the intrigue and the politics and and that sort of thing. And a lot of DMs like running that. Um, you have the dungeon, certainly ubiquitous and very common and somewhat easy. Bam, you're in a mega dungeon. Okay, so we're going to spend our entire campaign in a mega dungeon. You don't have quite the variability that you might in the outdoors, um, but you know there's a lot of road to cover, and as you mentioned, a lot of content to write. Um, with going outdoors, you have a lot of things that are going on. Um, one, just the fact that you know. Okay, here's the great outdoors. The gates open to the village, and you, know, you look beyond, and you see the hills rolling, and there's the farmlands, and there's the dark woods, and there's the mountains off there. What are you gonna do? Uh, turn around. Um, you know, so, so you have to provide them a reason to come out, um, and and that was uh, one of the first things that that I had to do in my campaign. Then you have to keep it interesting um, and, and take into account things that you know. Yes, it can be boring. Okay, so it's day 35, check off our rations, and okay, so we're going to go hop another hex. And oh, sorry about that. Um, and, you know, that's not what I try to do. Um, I try to present it as a day of travel. 
you know, some days are easy. Okay, guess what? You made it through today and you're camping and, you know, we can go through. But I like to introduce things to players that make it interesting. Give them reasons to be there. Give them reasons to explore. Much like you would a dungeon. Hey, there's two doors. Which one do you want to go to? Well, the one that's interesting. Hey, there's you know, gold coins there. Let's go in that one. That one seems interesting. So I do the same thing with hex crawls. Um, I don't know that what I do is unique in as much as it's just my style and, and flavor of the way I play. Uh, you're right. I love to do this stuff. I love to ham it up. I love to, I love to see the players uncover my world. I think that's kind of the coolest thing. I'm an explorer at heart. You set me down, you know, to hike in a set of woods and I could lose myself for days and weeks because I love seeing what's over the next ridge, over the next hill. And I want players to have that sense of excitement. What is down the road? What are we going to run into tomorrow? What are we going to see when we come out of these woods? What are we going to do when we sail down the river, you know, for another day? And so I try to present the world as an unfolding experience to them. And uh, so, you know, I, it's kind of the way I do it. Okay. And how long has your game been running? Uh, you were saying that your continent of exploration that they could go through is about <laughs> the size of Russia. Yes, it is. I, I, I took a map of Russia and twisted and folded and spindled it and, and came up with this uh, interesting area. Um, it, if you walked it from one end to the other, it would take you about a year, um, provided you didn't you know, run into any problems. Just a straight line? Uh, just, just a straight line. You, okay. You'd start from the Duchy of, of Dawn, which is to the east, and you'd have to walk over the Sedasta Mountains, which could be problems. The orcs might get mad. Then you'd walk through the Duchy of Eurysia. You'd have to cross the uh, North Run River. Then you're going along the border of the Duchy of Elfest and uh, Regnum Central. Then you come up to the Duchy of Corridon, and you hang a little bit down south, and you go across the Oratares, and now you're on the west side. And if you survived all that, you're probably about sixth or seventh level. Uh, but it, it is a long way. As I mentioned, it's about 220 odd by 170 odd hexes, um, as as the uh, hexographer or worldographer tool counts it. Um, I came up with the map about a year after I started my campaign. I started my campaign in 2009. Um, I literally came up with three hexes and a home base. I was inspired by a guy named Ben Robbins, who it, at that time had published these blog posts called The West Marches. And The West Marches was a way that he ran a game where it wasn't him dictating the, the pace of the adventure and what the players were doing. They were. They would schedule their own games. He would tell them if he was available. They would tell him the mission. They would say, this is where we're going. This is what we're going to do. We're going to go out. We're going to do this. And then we're going to come back. And he ran this for a couple of years. And at that time in the little blogosphere in the OSR world, that really caught fire. It was like, wow, this is a really great way of, of doing these adventures. And we can kind of do this old school and have, you know, these all these great things. And I grabbed a hold of that. I thought it was a great idea. So I started off literally with three hexes of where the players could go and the home base uh, much like, you know, West March's uh, kind of, you know, outlined. And then I built it from there. Um, they expanded a little bit. They were, you know, trying to figure out where things were. And so I ended up uh, broadening the map probably by about a 10 by 10 area. And then I just got, I think I was bored one day at work. And I said, well, how can I make a, you know, where where are they at? What is this world going to look like? And like I said, I, I took Russia and folded it around a bit and said, wow, that looks really cool. All right, the players are here. <laughs> and I put them up in the northeast corner, drew out some features, did some you know vague kind of uh, you know, maps, what would be make the most sense, and have built on that ever since. Okay. Well, um, let's get back to hex crawling in general. Um, okay. Do you have a definition for that? Do you have a concept for it that is not just the technical, it's hiking through hexes? What, what is hex crawling? What is the story that's being told with that? Uh, well, that's interesting. What is the story being told with that? Well, part of that story is why are the players out there? You know, what are what are they doing? Where are they going? Um, as I mentioned, I like my players to have an adventure where things are unfolding for them. Um, even if they're going to a place where they've been before, there's a reason they're going back. So let's let let's have that unfold. So for me, um, 
hex crawling is about, you know, moving through your days of adventure outside, um, you know, running into things that are random, running into things that are planned, um, dealing with those and continuing on with your mission. Um, but that takes place outdoors where there's a lot more variability, weather, uh, you know, what kind of terrain you're in. Uh, have you been there before? Have you, you know, kicked over the hornet's nest, so to speak? Um, and, and so on. So for me, it, it's just a chance to get them to explore and experience the world rather than, you know, just in a dungeon. Okay. And uh, notice that <clears throat> the measurements that you use for your hexes are 24 miles, which is, mm -hmm. I think it's one day of travel for someone on foot, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Is there that, a reason that that's you, how I measured. Is there a reason that you chose 24 miles? <laughs> because I'm lazy. No, really. Um, it, it was. It started off as it was the easiest way for me to say, okay, so you can go here in about a day. Blam. That's that's where the adventure is. And okay, so you're going to go here and then you're going to go here. Okay, land, that's another hex. And so I had measured the distance of walking between the home base, which was called Anonia, and this lost city, which is called Aresia, at about, about eight to 10 days, depending on how you traveled and, and everything. So, you know, that was 10 hexes that way. Um, as it turns out, that also was very useful for wargaming. So I kind of stuck with it because then I could measure out how how far you know a troop could move in a week, or you know, you know how far could cavalry move. So it, it made it very nice that I started like that. Plus, twenty four is div is divisible by four and six, so you can actually if, if I wanted to break down into sub hexes, I could. And I should mention you had mentioned about you know the the fine detailed mapping. I have only done once where I've broken down my 24s into further groups of six. Um, and that that actually just happened recently because um, in another game that takes place in my campaign world, my players have gone to a lost island of Ramafia where a great city is and they're going to run into a lot of cool stuff. And because they're doing such a finely detailed grained exploration of this lost uh, place, I had to break it down rather than, you know, make it so large grained because, you know, this, the, um, the island itself is only about four hexes wide. I wanted to give them a little bit more to do. So that's why I broke it down. But as a rule, I don't. There's a lot of people that do it different ways. And I know some people are really strict about their scale and, you know, the, and because that's what they enjoy to do. If I need to break it down, then I can break it down, you know, into a six mile hex and it fits very nicely and I can do the map very easily. But for me, the way I move the players through the hexes doesn't feel like that to them because I use a couple of different techniques to fill the hexes and make them interesting so that for them, they don't feel like that, well, I'm moving here and then I'm moving here and then I'm moving here, or I feel like I have to do that. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, the, the game yesterday that I mentioned where they, they faced a dragon, um, that was what I call a major area in that hex. What kind of dragon was it? It was actually a wingless uh, green dragon, a worm. Okay. Um, and uh, it, it was an adult. It had a, quite a chunk of hit points, and it damn near killed a couple of people with its breath weapon um, until they used the loophole on me and scored 60 points of damage with one dice roll. I won't be doing that one again. Um, but uh, it, it was kind of fun. Anyway, so... Um, but also in that hex, I had a couple of other things. So near that hex was an ancient set of ruins. And if they had encountered that, then they would have found that there. Um, I kind of have a, me a method. And part of this is stolen from a uh, blog called Welsh Piper. Um, uh, the author, they wrote some really cool articles on how to create a campaign and how to create a hex map. And one of the things that they talk about is having major and minor encounters or major and minor things in each hex. And I like that because it works for me. Okay. You know, usually in a 24 mile area, yeah, you're probably only going to have like one major thing and then you're going to have a lot of littler things. And so then I'll, I'll populate it as such using kind of his, his uh, approach as a guideline. 
uh, unless there's something there I particularly really want. I've got a lot of different weird tools that I use that I've collected over the years. Um, I've created a spreadsheet generator that tells me what's in the hex if I want it. Um, but I try to have one major thing, and the players have to work hard to miss it. Okay. So they either have to say, we don't want to go there. You know, Yeah, we see the castle over there, and eh, we're not interested. Okay, that's fine. Um, and then minor things that they may or may not encounter. If they know about them and they're trying to look for them, then, you know, okay, well, there's a chance you may find it if you know where you're going. If not, then, you know, you don't. Um, or if they're just randomly walking through, there's a chance that they may, you know, run into that. So I kind of have that uh, as, as an idea of what's in the hex. Um, then there's random encounters. So uh, I roll a dice for the uh, day and I roll a dice for the evening. If, if they're camping out there, uh, you know, if it's during the day, then while they're, you know, walking through, I'll kind of, you know, another dice roll morning, noon, night, and that gives me an idea, okay, this thing will happen here. And then, you know, they'll have the encounter, or they'll, they'll deal with whatever that is. And then if they're camping out for the night, okay, well, then this thing happens here, uh, depending on where they're camping. So I, I, I don't necessarily have the map, but I know what's in there. And that kind of allows me a little bit of fluidity in how I present it. Um, you know, depending on what's going on with, with the players, what things have happened, uh, you know, uh, does the encounter happen near this major point? Does the encounter happen near the castle that's located in the hex or does it, you know, happen when they're entering or leaving or what have you? And those are all custom tools that you use for that? Oh, uh, well. Spitball it. Uh, no, um, well, a little both, but I mean, certainly I have things written and ready at the game table, but sometimes things will happen and maybe I'll adapt on the fly. It really depends on you know what's going on. The tools that I've built have been scraping things like uh, blog posts and other ideas and things I've seen in modules and that. And I kind of put them in, you know, two or three different places. And then when I'm thinking, oh, what do I want to put here? Um, you know, I'll maybe turn to my spreadsheet and and I'll just, you know, gin up the whatever it's, you know, if, if there's a settlement there, if there's a ruins there, if there's something interesting there. Um, and I I'll noticed also that you, you also share your own generator. Uh, I saw a village generator on your website. Yes, that and actually, it's a good point. Uh, talk about variability. Um, in my world, um, it's not lost civilization. There are parts they're going through that, that are quite well civilized. And I have a population density where it doesn't feel like you're lost. You know, you should be walking by, you know, three to four to six to 10 villages a day. So at some point, they're going to want to sleep at night. And so if they don't have a destination in mind, then this little generator is something I can do at the table you know, oh, look, you, here's a small little hamlet of 10 buildings and 50 people. And yep, yeah, you want to buy some stuff? Well, it's kind of a poor hamlet. So, you know, maybe there's only about 15% chance of you buying something. And then what I'll do is if I generate that on the fly, I'll note which hex it's in. I'll, you know, scribble down the notes of what I generated. And then I'll go back later and add that into my key. So that way, if they keep coming back and say, well, you know, you, you, you remember the village of Beckenridge that you stayed at, you know, three months ago? Well, it's still there. That kind of thing. Excellent. Yeah, I could use something like that. I actually just started it's my own blog post. <laughs> yeah. I just started my own uh, uh, hex crawl just last week and uh, went through about cool. six different villages that I'm sure I could use that. So, yeah. Oh, Very sure, cool. sure. And I, like I said, I highly recommend posts like uh, the Welsh Piper series is really good. Um, if you go research Ben Robbins and the West Marches approach, that's really a lot of fun. Not so much about how to create the hexes, but how to run a campaign of where people are traveling outdoors and how they do it. It was kind of interesting. Interesting, yeah. I thought that the West Marches was just for running games for large groups of like 20 to 30 people. Like not all at once, but multiple things going on in the same world kind of thing. Yes, yes. That That is one aspect of it um, where... Uh, and you let them kind of drive the action. And when I started out my campaign, I had close to 20 people in it. So this kind of worked out. Um, you know, is it West Marches today in the strictest sense? No, but it had its roots in Genesis there. And certainly I, I do still subscribe to the idea of not leaving someone in the dungeon at that point, but rather you go out, you do a mission, you come back at the end of the day. So you have a podcast. Uh, it's called the Dungeon Master's mm -hmm. Notebook, or Dungeon Master's Handbook. Handbook. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tell me about that. What are you doing with that? 
Uh, well, I am doing what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm sharing how I run a campaign. You know, I, I've been running it for a while. People seem to enjoy my games at, at conventions and events, and people always seem interested in how I do things on my blog. And I thought, hey, a podcast would be kind of a cool way to do this. Um, I also love TED Talks. Do you watch TED Talks? Oh, yeah. Of course. Okay. I love those. I, you know, I, I think that the way they present themselves in 20 minutes and getting their points across, I really, really like. And so I thought, I bet you I could do that, that I could share things about my campaign, th the way I play the game, the way I do things in 20 minutes, and maybe some people, you know, get some help from it. Um, I'm not an expert, uh, but, you know, I've been doing it for a while, and, and I like to share these things. I also learn when, when people comment and reply back and say, hey, you know, did you try this or did you see this? And, you know, that's always a lot of fun. So um, I'm on episode – I'll be releasing episode 11 tomorrow. And, um, you know, just keep on going. I'm probably going to do about 20 episodes for season one and then take a break and, and see how that goes and, and then start again. Uh, that will take me about halfway through the year, and, and and we'll see how it goes. Cool. And how about your blogs? Are you what's your plan with that? It well, like I still. Have, it, it looks like you have two blogs. Uh, well, yes, I, I have the one for the Dungeon Masters uh, uh, handbook um, because I, I found the uh, you know people. People who come to my blog don't necessarily want to see me going on and on about my podcast. They know about the podcast. We see the graphic there. We'll go to it. Um, but if people are doing searches, then they can find that. And, and you know, we kind of cross link to each other. But the um, the blog right now, I'm, I'm still sharing things about my campaign. Um, I'm still sharing about what's going on. But uh, I started this thing called uh, The Three Hexes, which, which we mentioned um, what I'm doing is I'm posting weekly campaign starters, much like how I did. I believe that you don't have to write reams and reams of content to start off with a really cool campaign. Uh, I started off with three hexes and, you know, it's grown and, and nine years later, I, I'm doing a lot of gaming in this world. Uh, so this is just my way of saying, Hey, you really can do it. And, and I do different genres. So, you know, there's a lot of fantasy there. Um, you know, I do things that are set in the future, traveler like stuff. I just did one called the plague lands, which is, you know, kind of a, a mutant crawl classic, uh, metamorphosis, alpha gamma world kind of take on things. Why don't we, um, why don't we zoom into the plague lands and uh, okay, we'll sure. talk about it in, in depth so people can kind of see what you're saying. Oh, okay. All right. Here, let me click over there. Um, do you want me to read this or just give a summary? Yeah, a summary is fine. I mean, you have four hexes. There's the starting point and then the three connecting yep. hexes of interest. Right. So what I'll do is I'll explain the campaign. And I try to do it in three sentences, so a paragraph. Um, you know, the Plague Lens idea was I, I played Fallout 3. I've watched my son play Fallout 4. Um, and I happened to see a news article on, uh, you know, chemical. and I thought, well, you know, that would be kind of an interesting thing to, to make a campaign about. What would a campaign be like if you were living in, in the post-apocalypse of a world where there was tons of disease and people were changing because of it? So that's where I came up with the, the kind of the overall story of uh, the Plague Lands. Now, the, the home base, very much if you've played Fallout, you, you'll get the vibe that I'm going here. You know, I describe it as a ramshackle collection of huts, shacks, and buildings constructed out of the rubble of a town. Sounds like Megaton, right? Um, you know, there, there's even a remnant of the time before, which is half a metal sign saying Ace H for Ace Hardwares. Um, so... You know, I talk about that and I talk about some interactions that they're having with some of the uh, other uh, residents of some of the other hexes. Um, one of the hexes is the city, you know, great location for adventurers who want to go grab stuff or if the DM wants to put a hook there. It's like you're you know. crawling through buildings looking for loot and, and so on, like. Exactly. Yeah. Except that there's giant insects Wait. that scuttle among wow. the rubble. Right. You know, because what what is a giant city that got nuked out and and you know uh, biochemed out and giant cockroaches and centipedes and ticks and other things that of are course. gonna kill you? You can't make it easy for them. 
Oh, no, it's no, no. You know, I even said, you know, the, the last two scavenger parties have never returned, leaving many to think that the insects are finally too numerous or more ominously too organized. Um, then, of course, you have to have the rad zone. Um, you know, this is where a nuclear detonation happens. So now you have the dreaded trogs, uh, you know, uh, human mutants that were caught in the blast. Okay. Uh, you know, and talk about that. And then, then we have Fort Fens which is a thick swamp that has water coming from the rad zone. And this is where mutated humans, elves, um, have taken over the military fort and they are actually arming and equipping zombies with weapons. Come on, who wouldn't like to see a bunch of rage zombies on The Walking Dead with some military hardware? I think that would be an awesome episode. So that was kind of my my inspirations there. And, and you know, I, I come up with a rough idea I'll sketch out the map, and sometimes the map writes the story, sometimes vice versa. It, it just depends on how I'm feeling. I try to leave them vague in general and, and think of it like I'm setting up the pins for bowling. So I'll set up kind of the situation as it is now, but I, I leave it vague enough because I want these to be starters for you, the GM, to take it and interpret it the way you may want. You may want that dynamic, you know, constant conflict and all that. You may interpret it a certain way versus someone else that may have a completely different idea. And so I try to not influence it too much as much as I try to give them something interesting to start with, and then they can kind of fold it and, you know, do whatever they want to do with it. Um, faction conflict, always is opportunities for the PCs. And so if I at least give them something that they can get involved in, um, that gives them the chance to, you know, kind of decide for themselves in, in a, you know, because in a sandbox, you have the freedom of deciding, do I want to go here? Do I want to go there? And, you know, the world is going to do what it's going to do, whether or not you get involved. But if you get involved, then you're changing how the world's going to react. Um, I had one a couple of weeks ago where it was called the Great Storm. And the idea was that the storm is randomly moving throughout the land and it just levels everything in its wake. Uh, do you remember Dune? The, the Dune yeah, books. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. So um, the board game, the 1979 board game from Avalon Hill, had this great mechanic of this random storm that would swirl around. And boy, if you didn't have your troops in a certain place and you didn't have things locked down, you lost stuff. I love that. I think that's great. And, and it's this random thing that everyone's got to deal with. But after the storm leaves, there's kind of this point of where. Maybe an enemy wants to now run in and jump in and grab that land. And maybe someone else is doing it, or maybe they're going to send help because they want to make friends. You know, But I leave that up to the DM. How do you want to take that? But it also gives the players some agency there of, well, maybe we want to go help the people that are doing the invading. Yeah, I want to be a conqueror for a day. Or maybe they want to be you know, the helpers and go in and rescue the people. Or maybe they just want to be good thieves and loot the place. Hey, you know? There's probably gold there. So I, I try to do these in such a way that I'm not dictating what it is and how you're going to interpret it. And I'll tell you where I got that idea from. Um, you probably heard of him, Dyson Logos. He creates almost weekly these awesome maps. You, know, you, you talked about the idea of maps and how important they were. He's been doing this for years and years and years, and he's got so many maps. If you go on the web, if you ever need a map for like a dungeon or a town or something, just look up Dyson Logos, D-Y-S-O-N-L-O-G-O-S, and trust me, you'll find a map that you'll love. Well, when he presents these maps, he gives it a little story, and it doesn't dictate what you do with it, it just gives you kind of an idea of the setting and it sets up some pins and it sets up some ideas and you can use them if you want, or you can throw the whole thing out and start with your own. And that's much what I'm doing here with my three hexes. All right. All right well, very good. Uh, where can people learn more about you? Well, um, Chicago Wiz Games is my uh, blog. So C-H-G-O-W-I-Z-Games.blogspot.com. Uh, you can find me, I, I post on Reddit, I, I post on other forums and such. Um, of course, on my podcast, uh, uh, DungeonMasterHandbook.wordpress.com, or if you go to SoundCloud and look up Dungeon Master's Handbook, or if you go to iTunes, look up Dungeon Master's Handbook, I'm on there. 
Um, or just drop me an email. Heck, uh, you know, I can share I can share my email. It's uh, chgowiz at gmail.com. One thing I did want to mention, although it's not pertaining to Hex, is, is uh, the one-page dungeon contest that is happening until May 1st. The idea is you uh, write a dungeon and its related key and any interesting things in one page. And uh, this is the 10th anniversary. It's actually something that I helped to kick off with a couple of OSR uh, folks, uh, David Bowman of Sham's uh, Grog Blog, and then Michael Curtis, who you might have heard from the Stonehill Dungeon, Mega Dungeon book that he wrote. Uh, we all came up with this cool little one-page uh, dungeon thing. And then uh, I, with uh, Philip Renard, also known as the Chatty DM, started the first dungeon page contest. Well, this is the 10th anniversary. So uh, I get to, I'm judging this year, Chatty's uh, judging this year. It would be really cool to see everyone hop on in and get a one-page dungeon in. Uh, Dungeoncontest.com, tons and tons and tons of sponsors and prizes. I'm, I'm kind of jealous that I can't enter because if I saw those prizes, I'd want to enter. But, uh, you know, if you, if you get to, hey, you yourself, you should give it a shot since you're getting into the OSR. What's, what's a better way than to jump into a contest and make an old school dungeon? 